thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, anyone who tunes in later. Um, I've, I manage our habitat team as Serena mentioned, but I've also had a lifelong fondness and passion for raptors. And through that, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with the speaker today, Ryan Borber, in a couple of different ways. Um, yeah, he's uh, currently a student at UC Davis, um, got his BS, his bachelor's there in 2015 and his master's in 2018, currently wrapping up a PhD. Um, and so I think I probably first met Ryan uh, volunteering at the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, where we both banned raptors. And actually through that, I had the privilege of collecting some of the data that went into this research, which was really fun, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna spoil how it was done. Um, and then more recently, um, while working on a master's thesis at Sonoma State, which is ongoing, um, I was able to collaborate with him in his lab at UC Davis and Ryan especially was was really helpful in helping me form my ideas for my my thesis. Um, Ryan has extensive experience studying raptors, especially for someone his age. Um, he's worked across the Western US uh, through UC Davis and through the Talon Ecological Research Group, um, has quite a few published papers through those. Um, and then he's also done a fair amount of work with uh, neotropical raptors in Belize. Um, some really cool stuff down there. Um, and my experience with Ryan is that he's a brilliant and creative scientist, but also a really good communicator. Um, so I, I'm really excited to, to hearing his presentation today. And I think we're all in for a treat. So thanks for coming today, Ryan. All right. Thanks, Eric, for the... Um really flattering intro. <laughs> really appreciate it. And thanks, Serena, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And thanks, everyone else, for tuning in. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about um, really my dissertation, my PhD research, um, kind of in a nutshell. So I'll kind of talk about some background, what kind of inspired me to, um, you know, start this study, go down this long road, and then also share some really um, some brand new results um, that, you know, I've been working on and kind of um, hint at some other projects that this work has led to. So, you know, I'm essentially talking about um, uh, the foraging ecology of migrant raptors, but, you know, raptors migrate with songbirds. So it's kind of a really cool um, study looking at kind of a migrating, migrating community of raptors and songbirds um, along the uh, California coast. So, you know, this is, I'm essentially talking about raptor diet and, you know, you might be telling yourself, hey, we know a lot about what raptors eat, um, but, you know, I would arg actually argue that, you know, most of what we know about um, raptor diet has been conducted on breeding and wintering territories of these species. So it makes sense because this is a time when birds are tied to known locations, they're tied to a nest site or wintering territory. Um, we can employ really um, conventional and uh, easy to um, implement uh, study techniques such as basic observations. Um, we can use um, nest cameras, we can collect pellets, prey remains um, for uh, prey identification. Um, but what this means is that when you consider that migratory birds spend about a third of their annual cycle migrating to and from their breeding and wintering territories, there's some baseline dietary information missing for raptors um, during migration. And so this map right here on the right is showing um, raptor migration corridors around the world. And this is um, a really interesting map to look at when you consider that many raptors will hunt daily during migration. So they're not, you know, um, storing a lot of fat and traveling really far distances. Um, say like some uh, passerines or waterfowl, you know, they're interacting along these routes and sometimes they stretch, these routes will stretch uh, thousands of kilometers. So there's all these predator prey interactions going on that are really hard to study. And it kind of leaves this um, really open question, like if raptors are hunting while they're migrating, are they following their prey during migration? So it's kind of the, the motivating questions for my, question for my uh, PhD research. And so I'll kind of go back to some, you know, 
I call them like little Easter eggs in these natural history books. So this first one that kind of was really, um, you know, it popped out to me when I was reading um, a Merlin uh, species account in Tom Cade's Falcons of the World. There's a sentence in there that just says, Merlins pursue flocking ground dwelling passerines right through the year and probably follow them in spring and autumn migrations. You know, so there's already like some hint, some, um, you know, naturalists and ornithologists like through time have kind of like had a hunch that these raptors might be really tied to their migrating prey. Um, and in Paul Curlinger's Flight Strategies and Migrating Hawks, he has a sentence in there that says, because immature sharks and hawks are less efficient at capturing avian prey than adults, they should be under some pressure to migrate earlier following the masses of migrating passerines. So there's already these thoughts of that these raptors are following um, their prey, um, just based on like basic observations through time. And there's been some studies that have actually, um, you know, tried to find this. So this, this first bullet is kind of from Paul Curlinger's book again, um, where this hypothesis emerges that, that raptors should migrate with their prey to increase hunting opportunities um, because they rely on that as an energetic um, like resource to complete the long distance journey. Um, and there's, there's some um, researchers that have even proposed that migratory avian prey have evolved strategies to avoid migrating with raptors. So this makes a lot of sense. If raptors are following their prey, there's gonna be some strategy to avoid, you know, coming into contact with them. And a lot of this, um, these theories um, by Eidenberg has, has been surrounding studying sandpiper migration strategies um, as peregrine falcons have recovered from DDT, as they've kind of rebound their population numbers, they've noticed that the, the migration strategies of their prey are also changing. So they, you know, they don't become victim of a hungry migrating falcon. Um, there's been some other studies that have presented some data um, kind of on this topic as well. So um, Aborn in 1994 um, in the Gulf Coast, um, you know, concluded that um, migrant raptor and songbird abundance is really correlated in space and time. So there are numbers kind of like are, you know, following each other. When there's a, a peak movement of songbirds, there might be also a peak movement of merlins as well, migrating. And then in New Mexico, DeLong et al. Um, identified prey feathers um, from the feet of sharps and hawks migrating um, through their study site. And we're actually able to find that, hey, they're actually eating a lot more larger prey than the relative abundance of that prey would suggest. So they seem to be selecting energetically rewarding prey. So all really cool findings and kind of um, the only thing that hasn't really been done is um, a method hasn't really been developed to kind of look at this in a, in a kind of like a robust scientific way where we could collect lots of dietary data to kind of look at the interactions between um, these migrating predators and their songbird prey, which are also migrating. And so that kind of leads into um, the work I embarked on here at UC Davis for my dissertation. The first thing I had to do to even start studying this was figure out a way to collect raptor diet data during migration. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then once we get that diet data, you know, we wanna see like what they're selecting in relation to what's there on the environment. So is there a preference for what's being selected? Um, is there a selection or a choice? And then I'll go over some preliminary results and trends um, that are pretty exciting and new. So just diving right into how um, we developed this method to collect raptor diet data um, during migration, it kind of stems from you know, sometimes you might see a bird, a raptor, you know, perch. Take this Merlin, for example. If you look closely, you know, it's sitting there patiently on a barbed wire fence in the rain. You zoom in, you kind of see like, hey, there's some, some blood on its face. And, you know, it's probably from, uh, you know, a recent meal. Um, and inside that blood, there's got to be some DNA. And if we can collect that DNA, maybe we can identify it to what that, uh, Merlin 8. Um, and so to kind of give you an idea of where this is going, if we can get that bird in hand, we can maybe, you know, swab its face, maybe its feet, and then identify the trace DNA on that swab. And we would have um, some data on what this bird recently ate. And so that's kind of why we call it the dirty beak method. Um, there's various um, nicknames for it. 
but it also comes from, you know, when we're, um, when we're banding migrating raptors at migration monitoring stations, a lot of times, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's typical to see some prey remains on their face and their feet. And so this is like a golden opportunity. We have the birds in hand, they're getting measured, they're getting banded and released. But before we release them, if we could collect that, we'll have some really good dietary data of these birds while they're migrating. And so I often like think of this as, you know, I don't know if anyone's a fan of CSI crime shows. Um, it's kind of like that, except, you know, we're dealing with, um, you know, bird prey and it's kind of backwards. We have the, predator in hand, and we just need to collect that trace DNA evidence to identify the, the victims. So we're gonna take this method and apply it to um, um, essentially our study system, which is a specific migration corridor. Um, and we're sampling birds at the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, which is um, in the Marin Headlands, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we're trying to capture a snapshot of this interaction of these songbirds and raptors migrating past that migration um, bottleneck. And so to kind of zoom in on there, um, this is a really interesting or really unique location and kind of a migration monitoring station that's strategically set up um, right at the tip of this, at the Marin Headlands. It's where raptors that are following the coastline, you know, they kind of get funneled into the headlands. Um, they don't like to cross water, uh, large water bodies, so they'll sit and hang out for a little bit, gain some altitude, and then cross the San Francisco Bay. And then while they're doing that, um, it's a great time for um, scientists to count them and also um, ban them for, um, for scientific research, outreach, and conservation efforts. And so this is where we're capturing these um, these raptors and swabbing their face and feet to collect trace DNA um, data. So I'm gonna run through kind of a, um, um, a really simplified version of the methods for this research. So like I said before, we are trapping birds at the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory in the Marin Headlands. And right before um, we release them back into the sky, we kind of give them a little beak and talon scrub it's kind of like a spa treatment. You know, we release them back into the wild with really pristine beaks and really clean talons um, so they can continue on their migration. And then once we collect those swabs, we take them all back to a genetics lab where those swab tips undergo DNA extraction. Um, and we target a, um, a sequence, a, a DNA sequence in the mitochondrial um, DNA. Um, it's, it's in the, a gene called the CO1 gene. Sometimes it's referred to as a genetic barcode. And the good thing about um, studying bird eating raptors is that songbirds are well represented in this in genetic in a public genetic database. So if we can get those barcodes sequenced from the swab tips, we can identify them to species. And we used um, a DNA meta barcoding and sequencing technique. And this is a really cool technique um, that it sequences every molecule in a given sample. So we're able to detect multiple prey species on a single swab tip. So if a sharp chin hawk had eaten, you know, four different songbird species, we would be able to detect that with this method. And then once those samples are sequenced and we get a bunch of data back, we take those DNA sequences and then we reference them to um, a public genetic uh, barcode database, and we get back a bunch of data that says, on this specific sample, we had this many different types of species, and they'll actually specify that. So we got, we're able to get some really good dietary data just by swabbing the face and feet of these birds. And to kind of jump right into um, what we found, so one thing to point out is um, it took a few years to develop this method in the field, and in the lab and all those years, I didn't know if it was gonna work, but I'm happy to report that it worked pretty well. So for example, um, we looked at um, uh, Merlins and sharp and hawks, and we were able to detect 87 to 93% of the samples that we collected um, of the birds that we swabbed. We were able to get some kind of diet DNA or so, some kind of dietary information from those birds. And so that's a really, um, 
high success rate, you know, going into this, we weren't sure if it was going to be 50 or 60%. Um, so whatever we did, it worked really well. And what that breaks down to is we detected an average of three prey species per individual raptor. So like I said, these birds are hunting almost daily on migration, sometimes multiple prey um, per day, and we're able to detect that with this method. And so that for, you know, to break it down further, that was about 200 prey items for merlins um, and 1,400 for sharks and hawks. And we were able to detect 40 unique prey species in merlin diet during migration and 65 prey species in sharks and hawks. So um, a nice wealth of information from employing this method at um, these raptor banding stations during fall migration. So I'm gonna jump right into kind of talking about um, what we found for Merlin's, uh, for Merlin diet. So this is kind of a busy slide, but we'll walk through it um, slowly. So one thing to point out is that we were only sampling juvenile Merlin. So those are Merlin's on their first migration, because that's mostly what migrates along the California coast is um, juvenile raptors during fall. And so one of the important findings was that migrant songbirds were a really important um, component of Merlin diet during fall migration, something that a lot of people um, thought and had a hunch for, but we were actually able to show that with our diet data. We did have a really surprise finding uh, was that for eruptive migrants, so like red breasts and nuthatches and pine siskins, so those are birds that might have, might not migrate every year, but when um, in an eruptive year, um, there'll be a lot of them on the landscape relative to non-eruptive years. And so what we found was that in 2015, we actually had a high proportion of the diet was um, red breasts and nuthatches and pine siskins. And in 2016, not so much. And why that's interesting is that um, we looked at um, Christmas bird count data and eBird data. And sure enough, um, 2015 was considered a, an eruptive year for those species, those cone crop dependent species. And so we were able to kind of link raptor migration to a totally separate phenomenon um, that has to do with, you know, forest ecology and songbird biology, where um, that leads to eruptive um, songbird migrations. And then just to kind of further go back to the importance of finding that migrant prey are a really big, uh, important component of migrating Merlin diet, was this, this figure here on the right kind of shows that during peak songbird migration, um, in Northern California. So this is like in September, um, ending in early October. Merlin diet um, was comprised of a greater proportion of migrants um, compared to resident species. So we are seeing a signal that Merlins may be responding to that abundant food source of migrants as they migrate south along the California coast. And it just further highlights, um, you, know, um, you know, the conservation of stopover habitat for migratory songbirds has, may have a direct link to um, raptor migration as well, if they're depending on these species as an energetic um, resource during fall migration. And so a common question that kind of keeps coming up with our method that we use for this study is, so we're detecting all these, um, all this dietary data from these predators on the move. So like what what are we actually sampling? And so like, how long does this prey DNA stay on the face and feet of these migrating raptors? And it's a good question and a tough question, but I can talk about it a little bit. Um, so right here is a map um, generated with, um, and uh, some eBird data of some of the rarer species that don't really occur in the vicinity of our sampling location in the Marin headlands. So species that showed up in the diet, like common red bull, mountain bluebird, mountain chickadee, and pine grosbeak, with common red pole being the really notable one. So there was one Merlin that had um, common red pole DNA on their um, beak and talon. And at the time of sampling, this was, I believe, can't remember the day, it was mid-September. According to eBird records, that common red poles are reported, um, you know, up in Canada. So not pretty far from our sampling location. So if you were to twist my arm and say like, how long is this DNA say on the beaks and talons of these raptors, I would have to say, you know, as the falcon flies, probably, you know, at least a few days, um, considering that, you know, on 
um, a migrating raptor might travel, you know, up to like one to 200 kilometers a day on a, on like the faster end. And it also depends on like how messy a feeding might have been. So, you know, if it was a really messy feeding that a Merlin had up in Canada and it kind of created some, you know, songbird jerky under its chin and it stuck to that, um, the feathers under its chin for a really long time, we would sample it many days later and still detect DNA. So kind of like an interesting thing to think about and consider when we're interpreting the results for this study. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears and kind of start talking about um, prey selection by Sharps and Hawks. Um, so Sharps and Hawks were the other species that we looked at and this is a really exciting study because we're gonna be able to compare the diet, the diet data we collect from these birds to prey availability um, on the landscape. And this is because of a few reasons. So in the Pacific flyway or along the um, California coast, sharks and hawks are a really conspicuous migrant, the predictable timing and abundance. So unlike Merlins, um, which on the California coast kind of um, uh, migrate through in lower numbers, not as conspicuous, sharks and hawks have a really conspicuous peak migration. And so it's not, it's not um, unlikely on a peak migra uh, raptor migration day at the end of September to see hundreds of these birds migrating past a single point. So they're a really good species to look at when we're trying to look at um, migration diet data on the West. We're also more confident where sharks and hawks are hunting in California. So they're really tied to like woodland and shrubland habitats. Um, and so that's gonna help us kind of extract the spatial data or where we're gonna extract spatial data for prey availability. So that's where eBird comes in. So eBird is a really good, a really, you know, has it's a, a wealth of data. Um, so I'm sure everyone's into birds here. Most of you, I would be surprised if not all of you are really familiar with eBird and maybe submit eBird checklist um, yourself. So we really took advantage of that because they, Cornell and eBird have been putting out lots of data, um, data packages um, and um, that are available for extracting and statistical models. So the first thing we did was we kind of defined the area where we wanted to extract this eBird data. And so um, we decided since, you know, because it's kind of unknown how long this DNA, this prey DNA is staying on beaks and talons of these migrating raptors. Uh, we went a little farther north than our sampling site in the Marin Headlands. So the south end of our sampling region will be the Marin Headlands, um, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge, all the way up to the northern edge of Mendocino County. And this is where we're gonna extract the prey availability to see like what's available in the landscape for these um, hungry hawks as they migrate south. And so once we define our study area for the eBird data, um, we extracted weekly abundances from pixels where sharks and hawks are being reported. So this kind of confined um, our data extraction to where, to compatible habitat, where these predator prey interactions are likely occurring. And so we, in the end, we had weekly abundances for all the prey species in our study. And it's kind of what it looks like, this really pretty uh, picture right here, which is all the relative abundances of um, uh, 60 or 70 songbird species that occur in this region. Um, and so using this relative abundance data that we extracted, which is kind of like summarized in a really busy way on this um, graph on the right over the fall migration season, we're able to use that data and kind of run it into um, statistical models. Um, and so like before I move on, you know, I have to, you know, thank everyone that does submit eBird. Um, it really is an invaluable resource and lots of cool research is coming out using this data um, that go, that are, go way beyond um, this study. This might be the first one using eBird data to look at raptor diet and, and uh, prey selection of songbirds. So thank you all. Um, before I get into kind of like our statistical models, I, I do want to touch on something that um, really quick, which is for sharps and hawks, um, they're, they exhibit reverse sexual size dimorphism like to a really large degree. So here in this picture on the right, um, we have a female sharps and hawk on the left, 
and a male on the right. So quite a big size difference. So, you know, going into this, we kind of had this hypothesis that, um, you know, females are a lot larger than males. So they would probably be selecting larger prey. And that's exactly what we found with our um, dietary data. So if you look at this graph on the, on the left, um, this box plot just shows each dot represents uh, an individual prey species detection. And so essentially, on average, females did were detected with larger prey more often than males, and males were detected with smaller prey more often than females. So this, um, this is just showing the, the number in grams of the prey species, the average uh, mass. And so this might be, this wasn't like a surprise finding, but it's actually really cool that we're able to show this. And, you know, I could, we could probably give a whole talk on, you know, the theories and hypotheses of why reverse sexual size dimorphism evolved. Um, typically it has to do with um, the breeding, um, the breeding season. You know, for example, females are larger because of uh, nest defense, um, things like that but we're seeing that translate into migration diet for juvenile hawks, which is really interesting. Um, and just another fun thing to point out, you might be wondering what these two really large um, prey items are up here. So to put it in context, you know, a male sharpshin hawk is around hundred grams and a female is um, about 160, 100 to 180 on average. And so those two dots up there are a band-tailed pigeon we detected two um, on two females. And, you know, so it's really interesting that these, these migrating hawks will select anything from the size of a bantail pigeon to um, the size of a Anna's hummingbird. Fun fact. So um, don't get too overwhelmed here, but this is um, jumping right into um, some really busy figures, some kind of like at the tail end of a statistical analysis where we looked at um, prey choice of these sharps and hawks. So because there's such a big difference in what size prey and what type of prey they're selecting, we did run these separate for males and females. And so the only thing I want to point out here is that we were able to actually using this eDNA data that we collected at the raptor migration monitoring station and the eBird data to actually find signals of prey species that may be selected for or that there's a preference for um, during migration. And so we use, um, you know, this fancy model, the Beijing discrete choice model, which is something that economists use to figure out what um, consumers like to buy. So I'll just kind of focus in on the species that were selected for. We found like a, a significant um, statistical result for. So some of these species, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to speculate like, hey, what is it about these species that they might be um, really desired or like really... Um, a fine prey choice for these migrating hawks. So species like um, hermit thrush, spotted toe, Swainson's thrush, those are, you know, species that, you know, will form um, loose flocks during migration. They're kind of solitary, maybe joining, um, you know, following other flocks of um, migrants and uh, foraging flocks. Maybe they're more susceptible to predation when a hawk comes uh, flying in. So one cool thing about sharpshin hawks is they kind of have an ambush style um, hunting technique. So they kind of key in on bird activity and will kind of fly into there and, um, and grab whatever they can. So some of these species may stand out more in these mixed flocks um, um, uh, during fall migration. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these species um, in the following slides. So some other really cool results that we got from these um, kind of um, you know, uh, preference models. Um, this is kind of a busy, um, busy, uh, busy output, but I just wanna focus on two things that were really exciting that I saw was, was prey availability. So male, we found that, we found for both male and female um, prey choice, they tend to select prey that are highly available. So this kind of goes back to those kind of um, anecdotes and theories that were proposed that um, these, these hawks aren't very good at hunting, they're gonna to wanna to follow these really um, you know, abundant migration flocks to kind of increase their hunting success. So we are seeing that kind of in our output. And this other one, so they tend to follow or be selecting species that join mixed flocks um, during fall migration, as opposed to species that will um, 
create large flocks with con specific such as red winged blackbirds or um, um, chickadees and things like that. So really cool kind of like traits of the prey are coming out in this um, these models, which um, before have just been kind of like speculated on, but we're actually finding some actual um, data to back them up now. And so this kind of leads into um, kind of this temporal and spatial like um, view of like what's going on in this this relationship between migrating raptors and their songbird prey. So for looking at, you know, just at a, a glimpse at some of the relative abundance index indices from eBird data, we kind of see that they, you know, sharps, as sharps and hawks tend to build in their numbers, so do their prey, but which are, does that actually mean that they're following these migratory prey? So for example, hermit thrush and fox sparrow were one of the um, um, species that we determined were actually being selected for during fall um, along the California coast. And their abundance, you know, is pretty closely related to the abundance of the sharp shin hawk during that time. And so this kind of leads us to how do we take this information and kind of look at whether they're actually tracking, if, whether sharp shin hawks are actually tracking their prey during migration. It's a really um, difficult thing to kind of like statistically test, but that's currently what we're working on right now. So I can show you some like, you know, fun, fun outputs from this data that, um, you know, I think you may be the first group to um, lay eyes on. I don't even think my advisor has seen this yet. Um, so, you know, as we're looking at, you know, the diet data collected through eDNA method, swabbing beaks and talons, and the eBird records for say yellow warbler, we can kind of see that they're really tied and close in time. So this um, red, orange line is the um, relative abundance of eBird, um, of yellow warblers according to eBird um, records in our study area. And so as they kind of like increase um, in fall and then decrease, they're also showing the same signal in the diet of these migrating raptors. So really cool visual to kind of like, you know, speculate on what's going on between the, these mi a migrant predator and their migratory prey. We can even look at like hermit thrush. So hermit thrush are a really top prey in, in this diet study on sharp shin hawks. And, you know, their abundance really builds over fall and, you know, they're a partial migrant, so they will winter in the area. So their abundance stays relatively high, but we're also seeing that signal um, kind of mirror that um, in the diet of these migrating hawks. I have a couple other fun ones. So like even swains and thrush, um, so these are, you know, a long distance migrant that, you know, they'll, they'll build and then really decline. They have a distinct like migratory peak um, along the coast, but they're represented relatively high in the diet of these migrating hawks. So this is a species, you know, is there something going on like our sharps and hawks? Why are they selecting them more than their relative abundance may suggest? So really fun things to kind of tease apart. So a lot of folks are asking me what I'm doing this summer and it's playing around with this data, trying to get a meaningful product out of it. So just to kind of wrap up the uh, kind of migration diet study, um, the predator prey interactions between raptors and songbirds um, along the California coast that I've been talking about. So um, some key points that like always come back to my mind are that, you know, it's, it's interesting and to kind of like imagine that and remember that raptors and songbirds migrate together. Um, so there's definitely some interactions that kind of are really cryptic or not, not that easy to study because these birds are moving far distances over a short amount of time and it's hard to get a snapshot of what's really going on. Um, another really important thing um, I think about a lot is that migration diet is kind of a missing puzzle piece in the life histories of raptors around the world. And the reason I believe that is, is because it's really hard to study, um, you know, to kind of collect the, the dietary data presented in this research, you'd have to be, um, you know, using like direct observations, you'd have to be, you know, at the right place at the right time in many, many instances to kind of capture that um, or document that prey selection. Um, also, you know, we use, a, we use eDNA, an eDNA approach 
which, um, you know, it showed that it actually might have a lot of promise in studying raptor diet and these kind of like predator prey interactions within migration corridors. So that's a really, you know, noteworthy thing because eDNA approaches are typically being used in um, kind of like aquatic ecology um, and systems like that. So we kind of applied it to a novel area. And it, you know, pairs well with migration monitoring stations. Um, you know, at migration monitoring stations, we have birds in hands. We're collecting morphometrics, um, morphological data, um, um, and other samples. You know, we can we can now collect dietary information as well. And you're able to kind of detect, you know, things you wouldn't be able to detect in other situations, like with direct observations. We were able to show that males and females are selecting differently sized prey. And we're able to show with data that migrant avian prey are a critical resource for these uh, migrating raptors. And, you know, the success of this method has broad implications, you know, it has conservation implications when you think of full life cycle um, conservation and research. So, like I said in the beginning, um, we, you know, when you think about it, raptors spend a third of their annual cycle on migration. So we kind of need to know what resources they're relying on um, during migration, along with the breeding and wintering territories. And also like really noteworthy is that this research, this whole study was made possible by citizen and community science efforts. So the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, a nonprofit powered by uh, um, community science volunteers, and then also eBird, which is um, data contributed by the public. So a really cool application of um, genetics and um, citizen and community science efforts. And to kind of give you know, some teasers um, of some other applications we're currently exploring with this method. So we are doing some work around um, Yolo County, around the Davis and Sacramento area, looking at rodenticide exposure on farms of raptors. And so we're collecting you know, blood samples and testing them for poisons, but we're also collecting a dietary sample. So if we get a positive, um, for example, if we test the blood of a red tail hawk and it has it test positive for an anticoagulant rodenticide, we'll also have a swab sample so we can kind of see what that bird was eating to kind of, um, kind of directly um, correlate the diet to um, um, risk of exposure of toxins on the landscape. Um, yeah, that's, I made this gift to kind of give you a sneak peek or, or a pre, or I guess a, a glimpse of what a red tail getting a swab looks like. It's a, a lot of towel on the swab. So lots of prey DNA on there, I'm sure. Um, we're also kind of starting another study where um, we're focusing on American kestrels, which are a species that are of um, increasing concern in North America. They're declining across their range. Um, and so we've kind of started a, a winter diet study on farms to kind of see what they're eating um, to get through the winter. Um, one of the hypotheses for their decline is that it might be a declining food base. They do depend on a lot of arthropods um, or insects um, around um, throughout their annual cycle and also rodents and other vertebrates. And so we've been collecting eDNA samples from their beaks and talons to kind of capture their, uh, their diet on these kind of industrial landscapes um, around Davis. And I did kind of put together a video to kind of show you what a kestrel having his beak clean looks like. Um, they're mostly confused by it. So um, <laughs> yeah, when we release the bird, it you know has a really clean beak. We have all the blood on the, the prey blood on the swab tip and we kind of will take it back to the lab and find out what it ate during winter. And with that, I think I'm out of time, but um, I just want to say before, uh, um, we go to questions that this study was really made possible by a lot of people and a lot of organizations. A lot of collaborators made this possible. Um, the study kind of like was officially started in 2015. So it's kind of like a long time in the making. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of highlight that before, before I wrap up. And yeah, thanks for listening. Um, hopefully you found it interesting. Thank you so much, Ryan. I know I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, I thought it was a great talk, and I think it's so cool that your research has so many different dimensions and uh, you know to your data and to your analyses. And it's it's so cool. I feel like I'm getting this insider look into the lives of raptors that you know not a whole lot of people get to 
learn about. So thank you so much for your work and for sharing it with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for inviting me. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Um, and we already have a ton of questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna jump right in and read those out to you. So uh, the first question is from Linda, who is a GGRO volunteer. Uh, Linda said, I didn't think that GGRO caught that many Merlins during migration. How many were in the study? And I think I remember seeing on a slide, it was something on the order of like 77 or so maybe? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So it was 77 over two years. So I sampled Merlins in 2015 and 2016. And those were, 2015 was a good Merlin year. I think I had maybe 40, I think GGRO caught 40 or something around 40 something that year and then 25 the following year. Um, yeah, I don't know if that adds up to 77, but, um, but yeah, they, they are relatively rare um, <laughs> to catch um, at the site, but luckily I had one good sampling year for them. Nice. And I guess since uh, there, I saw that another question was uh, maybe a little bit related to that, but um, one of them was, what was the reasoning behind picking the two raptor species profiled in the study? Is it their abundance in the area or something else? Yeah, that's actually a really good question that um, kind of, I guess I forgot to kind of, um, you know, explain. Um, I picked those two uh, mostly because um, it was kind of supposed to be a trial study. Um, Merlins are just really interested in seeing what they ate. And sharks and hawks were kind of like, you know, Merlins are pretty elusive on the landscape. And so we kind of wanted, it was kind of like a, you know, really fascinating species to kind of document their diet during migration. And then on the other hand, sharks and hawks are really abundant um, during fall migration. So we kind of wanted kind of like two different types of raptors with two different types of abundances in the area. Um, we, we have talked about, there. Are, I mean, there are a lot of other species we could look at. Um, you know, Cooper's hawks um, are, have been talked about in future studies because they are also really abundant um, during fall migration. But it was also, we only picked two because we didn't know if it was gonna work. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see a lot of, um, you know, other species looked at in the future. And along those lines, do you know if there are any similar studies that are being done in other parts of the country? Um, <laughs> There is not exactly the same, but there are some other research groups that are um, looking using a DNA method to um, kind of capture migration diet. Um, I think I saw a presentation recently, um, a grad student was looking at like colloquial swaps, so kind of looking at fecal DNA. Um, one of the reasons, you know, when we first started this study, um, people that were using meta barcoding, barcoding wanted us to use fecal, but Fun fact, raptors, or at least hawks and falcons on migration don't, don't poop in hand. Um, so, so we didn't wanna like hold them for extra long um, and swabbing their face and feet seemed to work pretty well. Very cool. Hopefully some you know, people can start to adopt that method in the future too, and we can learn more about other raptors in other areas. Cool, so uh, a couple uh, more questions. So um, one is, do you have data on the sex of the prey or is it even possible to collect that? Um, that's actually a really good question. And I, it might be possible. Um, it's kind of hard to kind of like go down those roads um, just by the nature of the sampling. Um, it would be, you know, if you think about the sample, we're swabbing like the surface of their, the outside surface of their beak and talons. And it could be one of the, the kind of biases or caveats of the study is we may be detecting like, for example, you detect yellow warbler on an individual uh, Merlin. It, we don't really know if it was one yellow warbler or multiple that it ate. And so, um, I know there's methods to kind of uh, sex uh, DNA samples and blood, which would be kind of like an interesting <laughs> exploratory thing, but um, um, I, I wouldn't, I don't know what that would mean with like, we don't, we just know that species was selected. We don't know how many of that individual was um, in the sample, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I think that makes total sense. Um, another question was, do any of the preferred prey species have variable migration timing 
that you'd be able to compare from year to year to gauge whether the predators are following them? Yeah, that's actually a really good question that um, I hope to kind of explore. Um, so one thing about the eBird data that I extracted is kind of the new product that they put out and it actually is averaged over 20 years. So it might take a little more um, sleuthing to get year by year change. Um, but yeah, like some things that come to mind, you know, for example, you know, yellow warblers and Swainson's thrushes are kind of have like an earlier migration or they're kind of like finishing their migration while like hermit thrush and maybe um, white crown sparrows kind of like linger on or like migrate a little later. So there's like some temporal things we're going to look at with that, like within a given season, but like tracking over time is kind of like the million dollar question that I hope to kind of explore as well. Um, so yeah, it's, that's right where my, my, my mind is too. Right, and you had just mentioned swings and thrushes. Uh, Dan, who's one of our biologists actually, um, said, you know, maybe swings and thrushes are underrepresented on eBird lists. I would not be surprised. Yeah, so there's there's a ton of, not a ton, but there are biases and caveats with the eBird data, as um, I'm sure everyone can imagine. Even, you know, when I look at the Sharps and Hawk eBird data, there's, you know, a lot of uncertainty with that, um, you know how many of them were actually Cooper's hawks or like how many were like, you know, they might also be underreported as well um, on the eBird record. I mean, there's probably other prey species that might be really a lot more elusive and, you know, cryptic compared to, you know, a yellow warbler that stands out really well or <laughs> other more, um, you know, target species on people's um, like bird lists. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then uh, another question uh, that came in was, uh, was the study just during fall migration or also spring migration to compare? And how different are they if, if you did compare? Well, I, I do wish I could compare, um, but the GGRO just um, bans raptors in the fall. Um, so this was kind of like um, fall focused. Um, although I imagine if uh, migration monitoring site is you know trapping birds in spring migration as well that'd be a really cool comparison um, and it'd be really interesting like are they selecting the same prey um, in fall and spring migration or is it different yeah I, I'm curious about that as well cool yeah maybe uh, it could be an area of future research for someone um, so another question that came in was do you also collect data on non-avian prey of merlins and sharpshin hawks? Um, so for sharpshin hawks, we weren't considering it, um, mostly because, you know, they're cons they are considered, um, you know, songbird specialists, you know, but more than 95% of their diet are small birds um, or bird prey. Merlins, however, as I'm sure we all know that they, they can select different prey. Um, especially dragonflies um, and will opportunistically take bats or maybe small mammals. Sharp shins are probably opportunistic in that way, I imagine too. Um, however, we just looked at birds, just focusing on the, the single question of um, migrant avian prey. Um, however, I am trying to get funds to look at dragonfly DNA in those marine samples because so, you know it is kind of like an interesting thing it just costs uh, more money to look at more uh, different taxa. It just requires more like um, reagents in the lab and um, time and things like that. But um, yeah, it's definitely possible to look at more than just bird prey on these swabs. And that's actually what, um, so our Keschel winter diet on Keschels that we've started, we'll be looking at uh, mammal, bird and insect prey on those swabs. Cool, yeah. I Hope that you'll come back and talk to us more about some of those other research you have coming down the pipeline. Um, so a, a question from, uh, I guess, GGRO specific here. Uh, do you have to run over to the blind that captured the bird or were other volunteers or interns trained to collect the DNA swab data? Oh, that's such a good question that I wish I kind of um, explained that in the talk. Um, so I made a ton of sampling kits and so each um, blind had a bunch of kits. So each volunteer got to participate um, in swabbing beaks and talons. And from what I understand, it had really good reviews. Um, you know, it's kind of fun to, you know, give these birds spa treatment before you release them. 
so yeah, each, each volunteer was trained. So this is kind of like a, uh, you know, really big effort. So these, these blinds are run by volunteers seven days a week. And that's kind of what made this sample size possible. So um, that's a really good point. Nice. Yeah, Eric said it was lots of fun. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's the last question that I'm seeing at the moment. Uh, but if you do have any last minute questions, feel free to go ahead and enter those. Or if something comes up later on, you're welcome to email me and I'm happy to forward those to Ryan. Um, Eric, is there anything you want to say to Ryan? Anything you want to share with everyone? Um, I just want to thank Ryan for his presentation today. Uh, he's always uncovering some some more cool stuff about raptors. So it's cool to see how his research has evolved since uh, the last time I heard it. So yeah, okay. thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> we showed up too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Ryan. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh no, I was just going to ask you: Is there anything else you want to say to everybody else as well before we sign off? Um, just wanted to thank everyone again for, for listening. Um, like I said, nerding out about Raptors is kind of what I do. So whenever there's an audience. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you again, uh, Ryan, for your wonderful talk and for sharing your research with us. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening for this presentation. We really appreciate you being here. So have, everyone have a great night. We hope to see you again at a future event. Mm -hmm.